we're talking about what's often called the broad sweep of human history, right? And our current picture of the broad sweep of human history was invented long before my discipline of archaeology even really existed, let alone the discipline of anthropology. You can find it, you can find the germ of it in things that were written over 200 years ago, even over 300 years ago, in the writings of philosophers like Thomas Hobbes in England, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France, who were what were called at the time state of nature theorists, which means that they allowed themselves to speculate on what we were like, what our species was like in its original form. You know, what was that kind of original protoplasmic mass of humanity really like? What kind of, did they have religion? Did they have marriage customs? It was pure speculation and they were very open about the fact that it was speculative. And these stories which they told were in many ways parables for their own time. You know, Hobbes was living in a time of great conflict, the English Civil War. He told a story about how humanity was originally just like that, uh, a state of war of all against all. And it was part of the way that he reasoned out a justification for the creation of states and strong kingdoms as a way of limiting violence. Um, Rousseau told a different story a few decades before the French Revolution. He told the story about how humanity before civilization was a society of equals. Uh, and in that society of equals, people were happy. They were also kind of innocent. They didn't have very much yet in terms of material goods or technical knowledge. And then something happened to change all that. Uh, people started planting crops and from prop crops came the principle of private property, that's a mouthful, um, and from that come, uh, comes uh, uh, territoriality, uh, populations grow, we get cities, kingdoms, and empires, and eventually we end up with this very familiar story of civilization, which is kind of an ambivalent tale. On the one hand, things get better, we get progress, we get agriculture, we get metallurgy, we get the arts and sciences and philosophy. But with every advance, we fall backwards in the domain of human freedoms and equality. So for Rousseau, we start equal. But with every new invention, with every step uh, forwards, um, we become more trapped in our chains, as he puts it. So it's all a story which illustrates his famous point, you know, man is born free, but everywhere we find him in chains. And these two stories have, have had an extraordinary effect on the thinking of serious scholars right down to the present day. They've commanded the attention of social scientists, philosophers, people in my own field, who have a huge amount of knowledge and scientific facts at their disposal. But when they go after that holy grail, you know, they try to capture that broad sweep of human history. What we notice, David and I, is that they, they sort of slip back into these structures of thought, which go all the way back to Hobbes and Rousseau. So we're dealing here with some really powerful, tenacious, we would say, myths. Can, can I just want to tease out that structure of thought with Hobbes and Rousseau and mm. it's like a take a 30,000 uh, foot view of what they're saying, because they're ostensibly at, at, at odds with each other on some level, but they're almost like the two sides of one coin in that yes. they have a, a, a modality of progression that they are both espousing that is similar. Can you just speak on that so that we understand how, once you buy whichever side of that coin you buy, you're sort of falling into the same, you, you've already then limited. Yeah, you, you end up roughly in the same place, which is in a place where hierarchy and domination are the inevitable effect of societies getting larger and more complex. It's just that with Hobbes, you start off with sort of chaos and anarchy in his sense, and, and, and then you need those hierarchical structures to control it, to kind of tame those disruptive, competitive base instincts. With Rousseau, you get to the same end point, but you just start uh, from the other, <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. So you start in happiness and innocence, but it's actually the process of societies forming and a complex division of labor and technology that is paradoxically what, what is supposed to trap us in our chains. But either way, you end up in chains. And they're, and they're both a story of inevitability on some level, level as a function of, of human nature. 
Yeah, they both start with uh, uh, what is conceptualized as a, a, a single fixed uh, human condition, and then something changes and we're set on a kind of linear path uh, towards roughly where we are now. And so, and I guess the, um, the, the project of of the, the a new history of humanity is to attempt to impose to start to not use uh, Rousseau and Hobbes as a primary assumption and then work from there but instead to use evidence that we found archaeological and and uh, arguably anthropological evidence to reevaluate that story well, thinking back, it was actually a messier process because our original intention was to feed into those debates. I mean, the Rousseau story was actually the answer to an essay competition set by a French academy in the town of Dijon in 1753. And that was really one of the first times that people posed the question, what is the origin of social inequality in human societies? And is it a natural, is it authorized by nature? Is it, is it a natural condition. And people are still asking that question. And when David and I started working on this project, we saw ourselves as contributing to that ongoing discussion. But in the process, we came to realize that the question is a kind of trap, and we found ourselves falling into it. Because by even framing the big questions of human history that way, in terms of origins, what is the origin of inequality? What is the origin of private property? What is the origin of the state? You already you're automatically sort of back in that kind of linear mode of thought, where once upon a time we assume there was something else, something before inequality, and then something changed, so you get inequality. It already fixes you in a certain way of thinking, which actually wasn't working. I mean, it wasn't matching the evidence that we see in our own fields today from all these modern investigations. So we actually had to do something else. We had to actually start questioning the origins of the question about the origins of inequality in order to even conceptualize the kind of material that we now have at our disposal. And, and, and that uh, brought you to the indigenous critique. And, yeah. and, and, and I mean, explain to us, this, this is um, the, the, the argument, as I understand it, is yeah. that what we know as the European Enlightenment, and yeah. we're talking about sort of a, a big change in the, the I guess the uh, the understanding of of the world in many respects that took place in the 1600s and 1700s in intellectual thought um, was 18, yeah 18th century yeah 18th century um, was a function uh, in many respects of what. French missionaries learned from indigenous people. Well, we're not we're not saying that the entirety of the Enlightenment started there, but there are some very fundamental Enlightenment concepts, um, really mainly revolving around ideas about freedoms, social freedoms, and equality, which we do argue that the the way those ideas developed in European intellectual circles was profoundly influenced by the colonial encounter between mainly French colonists and the indigenous peoples of what's now the Great Lakes region of Canada, sort of down to upstate New York and over to Newfoundland. Um, and this, this is a story which we tell in one of the early chapters of the book. We knew it would be a provocative story. We say so in the book, um, but we're not the first ones to tell it and, and we stand by it.